Come on now. Aloha. Aloha. Here we go. Good afternoon. I'm Ron Clark. I'm the chief of staff of U.S. Indo-PACOM, the most expansive geographical combatant command on the face of the Earth. 52% of the Earth's surface. From polar bears to penguins, from Hollywood to Bollywood and all parts in between. And it is my distinct honor and privilege to serve as your MC today. On behalf of the Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Lloyd J. Austin III, welcome to the Change of Command Ceremony for United States Indo-Pacific Command. In this ceremony, Admiral John C. Aquilino will relieve Admiral Philip S. Davidson as Commander, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. This ceremony will also acknowledge Admiral Davidson's 39-year career as he retires today from the United States Navy. In recognition of Admiral Davidson's service in the Indo-Pacific region, he has received the following awards from partners and allies. From Japan, the Grand Cordon of the Order of the Rising Sun. From the Republic of Korea, the Order of National Security Merit, Tong Il Medal. From Singapore, the Pingat Jasa Jimilang Tentera, the Meritorious Service Medal. And from the Philippines, the Outstanding Achievement Medal. Providing our music today is the Marine Corps Forces Pacific Band, playing under the direction of Sergeant Fihaki. Please join me in a round of applause for their awesome pre-ceremony concert. In just a moment, the Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Lloyd J. Austin III, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark A. Milley, the Commander of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral Phil Davidson, and Admiral John Ocalino, incoming Commander, United States Indo-Pacific Command will take their places on the dais. To preserve the dignity of this ceremony, we ask that everyone turn off all your cellular devices at this time, and in an effort to keep all of our guests in the right frame and have the opportunity to view the entire ceremony, I will provide direction, when appropriate, to stand or remain seated. We ask that you remain seated during the presentation of awards and the reading of orders. For those in uniform throughout the ceremony, please remain covered. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moment, moments, I will ask that you stand for the arrival of the official party, the rendering of honors, and the parading of the national colors, followed by the national anthem, the Hawaii State Song, and the invocation. In accordance with naval traditions, we'll be piping aboard the official party, and it is customary to hand salute from the first note of the bosun's pipe through the ruffles and flourishes. And please be aware that the arrival of the Secretary of Defense, there will be a 19-gun salute in close proximity. So I hope you turned your car alarms off. And during that 19-gun salute, a hand salute should be held throughout the last volley of the guns. Today's side voice detail is comprised of members of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, who represent the more than 370,000 members of our team located across the Indo-Pacific area of responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. Bandmaster, sound attention. Time orderly, strike eight bells. Admiral, United States Navy, arriving.
Indo-Pacific Command. Arriving.
parade the colors. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem, followed by the Hawaii State song, Hawaii Pono'i. Retire the colors. The Indo-Pacific Command Chaplain, Chaplain James Edwards, will now offer the invocation. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we gather this afternoon to recognize the change in leadership of the United States Indo-Pacific Command, we pause to honor the direction and guidance that Admiral Davidson has given during his tenure as our commander. He has led Indo-PACOM during a time of heightened tension in this area of responsibility and during a worldwide pandemic. He has led with insight and thoughtful determination 
so that as a joint force, we have been prepared for the myriad of challenges we continue to face. We ask this day that he may hear from you in his heart of hearts that which we all long to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Bless all gathered here and bless this ceremony. We pray in your holy name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We ask that you remain seated through the remainder of the ceremony. Our national anthem and Hawaii state song were sung by musician third class Amanda Huddleston from the Pacific Fleet Band. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral Philip S. Davidson. Aloha. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, musicians mate, third class Huddleston. It's great to see you again. Thank you for doing all those songs here this morning. I appreciate the national anthem and the Ponoe very much, so thank you. On behalf of the Secretary of the Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, thanks to all of you for your attendance today. You honor Admiral Aquilino and me and our families with your presence. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming all of our distinguished guests serving in uniform and in civilian positions around the globe. So on behalf of everyone here on the dais, please allow me to recognize several of our esteemed guests at this time. Please hold your applause. Our Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Lloyd Austin, of course. The Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley. The Governor of the State of Hawaii, David Ige, and his wife, Dawn. Thank you, Governor. Former Governor of the State of Hawaii, George Ariyoshi, and his wife, Jean. Honolulu Mayor, Rick Blenjardi, and his wife, Karen Chang. Current and former ambassadors, esteemed members of our diplomatic and consular corps, and General Yamazaki of Japan, General Wan of the Republic of Korea, and other military leaders representing chiefs and vice chiefs of defense. So please join me now in a round of applause. I would also like to extend a very warm welcome to fellow flag and general officers, including former PACOM commanders, Hawaii state, city, community, and civic leaders, industry partners, senior enlisted leaders, veterans, allies, partners, and friends, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and all of those watching virtually around this globe in what is a hybrid ceremony, socially distanced here in person, virtual around the globe. Thank you all for joining us on this special day as we observe the transfer of authority, responsibility, and accountability of United States Indo-Pacific Command. I'd like to extend a special welcome to the Aquilino family. Lung and Laura, I cannot think of a team more deserving or more prepared to lead U.S. Indo-PACOM. We are thrilled also to be joined today by daughters Jessica and Lisa. A special welcome to my family here today as well. I am joined by my wife, Tracy, our daughter, Laura, and her husband, Kevin Gorslein, as well as our son, Benjamin. My mother, Shirley, and my sister, Susan Martin, are attending virtually, as well as a host of friends, shipmates, classmates, and relatives who have provided incredible support to Tracy and me on this unbelievable, nearly four decade long journey. Speaking of family, I would also like to welcome our extended ohana here in Hawaii. Tracy and I have been stationed in Hawaii longer than any other place during my time in uniform. And I can honestly say that the relationship between the state of Hawaii and the Hawaii-based military components and U.S. Indo-Pacific Command is absolutely the best in the world. We will truly miss it here, and we will do our best to spread the aloha spirit in the mainland. Now. For those of you that are unaware, Admiral Aquilino relinquished command of United States Pacific Fleet just this morning, and I must say that he has performed masterfully in this role over the past three years. So in a slight departure from tradition, I'm going to take the opportunity to present the awards so well deserved to Admiral Aquilino and his wife, Laura, 
for their incredible service and immeasurable leadership over the past three years. Admiral Aquilino has been commander of the world's largest fleet command. It encompasses 100 million square miles, more than half the Earth's surface, and he led Pacific Fleet to great success. People wonder what service components do. Well, the burdens placed on them are incredibly high, and they do ve two very critical things. First, on behalf of their respective service, they are required to build readiness. That is to say, to man, train, equip, train and certify forces for U.S. Indo-Pacific Command and other combatant commanders around the world to use to conduct operations and carry out our joint missions. Second, our components are responsible for advancing Indo-PACOM's theater strategy, in my case, in support of the nation's objectives in the region. Admiral Aquilino's understanding of the geostrategic landscape in this theater, his operational acumen, they have advanced maritime security and enhanced stability in the Indo-Pacific. I could go on and on about how, under the leadership of Admiral Aquilino, Pacific Fleet has furthered national interests, strengthened relationships in the region, produced and developed combat capabilities, and ensured the readiness of the fleet. But I will stop by saying this. I know there is no person on the planet more suited to assume the role of Indo-PACOM commander than Admiral Lung Aquilino. So to the men and women of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command and to our allies and partners in the region, you are receiving a steadfast and devoted leader. And, Mr. Secretary, you will be well served indeed. Lung and Laura, thank you for the incredible work at U.S. Pacific Fleet. Now, please join me front and center here on the dais. The commander of Indo-Pacific Command will now present awards to Admiral and Mrs. Aquilino. Ladies and gentlemen, as a reminder, please remain seated during the reading of citations and presentation of awards. The President of the United States takes great pleasure in presenting the Distinguished Service Medal with Gold Star to Admiral John C. Aquilino for exceptionally meritorious service to the United States in a duty of great responsibility as commander U.S. Pacific Fleet from May 2018 to April 2021. Admiral Aquilino's daily operational control over all naval forces under the direction of two numbered fleet commanders and five type commanders was vital to implementing the national defense strategy. His strategic vision, warfighting acumen, were instrumental in demonstrating to allies, partners, and adversaries the Navy's ability to sustain combat-ready forces at sea to defend and reinforce the maritime laws and norms that underpin global, se global security and prosperity. By his superior leadership, wide judgment, deep devotion to duty, Admiral Aquilino reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. The Secretary of the Navy takes great pleasure in presenting the Distinguished Public Service Award to Mrs. Laura Aquilino for distinguished public service in support of the U.S. Navy, the Department of Defense, and the nation from May 2018 through April 2021. Mrs. Aquilino's commitment to the mission and the people of U.S. Pacific Fleet significantly improved the quality of life for thousands serving in the region. She advocated, listened, and acted on behalf of sailors and provided meaningful Navy and community support to the nation's military spouses and children. Her vital role as an ambassador to U.S. and foreign dignitaries, her grace and devotion to areas of common concern for sailors and their families fostered a climate of trust and cooperation amongst our nation and our allies. Mrs. Aquilino's superb leadership, initiative, and total devotion to duty reflected great credit upon her and we're in keeping with the highest traditions of the Department of the Navy.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley. Thanks, Ron, to uh, you and the entire team out here at Indo-PACOM for putting this on. A lot of work goes into a ceremony like this. So I would ask for a quick round of applause for all the folks who do this. And since I'm one of the ones who's height challenged, I'm lowering the microphone for a little bit. So let me uh, first say thank you for everyone to be here. Uh, I want to point out a few of the dignitaries, uh, Phil, uh, just mentioned, but I want to particularly uh, thank uh, Governor Ige for uh, doing a great job in support of our U.S. military across the board, the entire Joint Force, for so many years out here in the state of Hawaii. So, Governor, uh, thank you. And I know we've got a lot of dignitaries here. I'm certainly not going to rattle them all off. Uh, there's ambassadors, uh, there's chiefs of defense, uh, but there are two that traveled quite a ways. We met yesterday for the first in-person CHODS meeting. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, General Wan uh, from the Republic of Korea and General Yamazaki from Japan. So thank you both for being here. And Mrs. Austin is uh, sitting right down here in front uh, with my spouse, Holly Ann. Uh, thank you both for making the trip because you represent the over 4 million families that are serving right alongside those of us in uniform. So thank you both. Uh, for being here. So, uh, most of all, I really want to thank uh, the families. So this is in part uh, about Long Aquilino and, and uh, uh, Phil Davidson, uh, but that's really not what it's about. What this really is about is Indo-PACOM. It's about the 300,000, 370,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardsmen, guardians, uh, and there are well over a million family members that are supporting them. That's what uh, today is about, and I want to thank all of them uh, for what they do every single day on Freedom's Frontier. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, the critical theater for the United States of America, and I want to thank all the families and all the troops that are out there right now on the wall. So, Phil, Phil Davidson, since graduating from the United States Naval Academy, Go Navy, Beat Army, in 1982, yes, I actually said it just for you. It'll be the only time you'll ever hear it. Until your present role uh, as commander of U.S. Indo-PACOM, uh, you've been outstanding in every way possible. Uh, you've consistently displayed the best example of a servant and visionary uh, leader. Whether you were assigned to shore or at sea, you've always addressed the Navy's global operations and requirements with the right mix of thought, decisiveness, talent, and you created lasting solutions throughout the Navy. The impact of your tenure as the 25th commander of U.S. Indo-PACOM has a lasting legacy for our nation and, more importantly, for the region and for global peace. And to Tracy, on behalf of all the families, of everyone in the Indo-Pacific, but really the entire joint force. You've given your all for 36 consecutive years, and your impact has been tremendous for your advocacy and your leadership. You've never received a dime for all the hard work, and we simply could not do what we do in uniform without you and the support of your children to folks like Phil. Family readiness is, in fact, force readiness, and thank you so much for what you've done. Holly Ann and I are both excited for you and Phil to be able to finally move to your home on the lake in upstate New York. And to Chris, call sign along, it's great to welcome you and Laura from Pack Fleet to indo -Pacon. After 32 years of service moving throughout the Navy, you've made that shot hop from one house to another on the island. And then in Long Aquilino, we are getting an Admiral's Admiral we are getting a fighting admiral in the spirit of Admiral Halsey. We're getting a leader who's extraordinarily capable of taking the helm of this great command. We are all excited, Lung, for you to take it to the next level. You know, the Indo-PACOM area of operations has the dual distinction 
of being our oldest and largest combatant command. It is really the globe's crossroads. 60% of world trade passes through this area of responsibility with 36 different countries, many of whom are represented here today, and 52% of the world's population spanning 14 time zones. It is the joint force of soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, guardians, and Coast Guardsmen of Indo-PACOM, along with our many allies and partners who safeguard the transit of those goods and the commerce and the information that keeps the world running and maintains the regional stability of Asia and peace throughout the entire world. We all benefit from the rules-based international order in a free and open Indo-Pacific. And we are a team of teams in this country as well as many nations who are represented here today. Thank you. Thanks to Admiral Davidson for your leadership, and we all look forward to the guiding hand of Admiral Aquilino to bring Indo-Pacific into the future. And we are also incredibly fortunate to have the steady hand of Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin leading the United States Department of Defense. Sir, it's a privilege to serve alongside you yet once again. He and I have served together for almost a quarter of a century in combat in many firefights. And throughout our years of working together, I've seen personally Lloyd Austin's deep commitment to the American people and to your steadfast support of our men and women in uniform. We, the Department of Defense, we, the Joint Force, are led by a man who has felt the sting of battle. He has held the dying in his arms, and he's led troops through the crucible of up-close ground combat. He's not only a man of great courage, he's also a man of immense integrity, genuine humility, and a deep compassion for those he leads. Thank you, sir, for your leadership. And I know with you at the helm, we will always lead with strength, and we will always lead with our values. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct honor to introduce our 28th United States Secretary of Defense, Lloyd J. Austin III. Thank you, General Milley, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Aloha. Aloha. It is a privilege to be here as we honor the leadership and the distinguished, the distinguished career of Admiral Philip Davidson and to welcome Admiral Chris Aquilino as he takes the helm of Indo-Pacific Command. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Admiral Davidson's family, his wife Tracy, their son Ben, and their daughter Laura. Tracy, as a military spouse, you've helped carry the tremendous responsibility placed upon our men and women in uniform. And all three of you have helped shoulder enormous burdens so that your husband and father could focus on his mission. You've been full partners alongside the Admiral, and the nation owes you a deep debt, a debt that it can never repay. So thank you for your lifetime of support, your sacrifice, and your love. I am equally honored to welcome Admiral Aquilino's family his wife, Laura, and their daughters, Lisa and Jessica. 
We are profoundly grateful to you for standing alongside him through his service. And I should warn you, it's about to get a lot busier. So let me offer you a big advance down payment of thanks from the department for the support that he's going to need in these next few big years. I'm also delighted to welcome our many distinguished visitors, our senior leaders, distinguished representatives of our allies and partners from across the Indo-Pacific, and our many friends from the great state of Hawaii, including, as you've heard, Governor David Ige, Governor and former Governor George Ariyoshi, and Mayor Rick Blangiardi. Thank you for your support for our mission, for this command, and for those two outstanding leaders. And finally, to the men and women of Indo-Pacific Command, you show us every day what it takes to operate in this theater from a position of strength and principle. And I really am so proud to be here with all of you. And I know it wasn't entirely easy for everyone to make it here today. Amid the pandemic, I'm especially grateful for this opportunity to come together safely and to thank all of you for your contribution to our country's security. In the past few months, the United States has set an impressive pace in vaccinating our citizens against COVID-19. We're, we're a democracy that knows how to do big things, that still strives for greater progress and inclusion, that still stands committed to a more open and peaceful and just world. And we will face the challenges of the 21st century with the confidence and the creed that has held, up, held us up throughout our history. But make no mistake, today's changes are going to demand a lot of new thinking and a lot of new action from all of us. You know, I'm a civilian now, but I've spent most of the past two decades executing the last of the old wars. And I will never forget the valor that I saw and the lessons that I learned as a commander in Iraq and CENTCOM. But the way that we fight the next major war is going to look very different from the way that we fought the last ones. And we all need to drive toward a new vision of what it means to defend our nation. In this young century, we need to understand faster, decide faster, and act faster. Our new computing power isn't an academic exercise. This is about real-world, real-time advantages. It's about fully grasping a situation moving at the speed of war. Galloping advances in technology mean changes in the work that we do to keep the United States secure across all five domains of potential conflict, not just air and land and sea, but also space and cyberspace. They mean we need new capabilities and capacities and operational flexibility for the fights of the future. And they mean that we have to redouble our efforts to work together across commands, across services, and across stovepipes. Now, the cornerstone of America's defense is still deterrence, ensuring that our adversaries understand the folly of outright conflict. As President John F. Kennedy said in 1961, only when our arms are sufficient beyond doubt can we be certain beyond doubt that they will never be employed. And you know, that principle still resonates today. And we are still the best in this business. 
We are ready now, and our enduring strength is rooted in the spirit of our democracy, including the ability to change course, to make use of the talents of all of our people, and to draw on the values of liberty. But being the best today isn't a guarantee of being the best tomorrow. Not in an age when technology is changing the character of warfare itself. And not at a time when our potential adversaries are very deliberately working to blunt our edge. And so our challenge is to ensure that our deterrence holds strong for the long haul across all realms of potential conflict. Throughout American history, deterrence has meant fixing a basic truth within the minds of our potential foes. And that truth is that the costs and risk of aggression are out of line with any conceivable benefit. To make that clear today, we'll, be, we'll, we'll use existing capabilities and build new ones and use all of them in network ways, hand in hand with our, al with our allies and partners. Deterrence still rests on the same logic, but it now spans multiple realms, all of which must be mastered to ensure our security in the 21st century. And deterrence now demands far more coordination and innovation and cooperation from us all. Under this integrated deterrence, the U.S. military isn't meant to stand apart, but to buttress U.S. diplomacy and advance a foreign policy that employs all of our instruments of national power. As the President of the United States has made clear, diplomacy must come first and the use of force must be a very last resort. The Department of Defense is here to help support the Department of State by providing the leverage that America's diplomats can use to help prevent conflict from breaking out in the first place. You know, it's always easier to stamp out a small ember than to put out a raging fire. And this is especially relevant as we hand over the baton to a new leader of Indo-Pacific Command. Admiral Davidson has done the nation a great service with his focus on deterrence in the region and the investments that he's made in our network of allies and partners. And he understands that we have to think about preventing the future fight, which increasingly is the fight of today. And if we can't prevent it, we need to be ready to win it, and to win it decisively. That isn't easy. We can't predict the future. So what we need is the right mix of technology and operational concepts and capabilities all woven together and networked in a way that is so credible, so flexible, and so formidable that it will give any adversary pause. We need to create advantages for us and dilemmas for them. And that kind of truly integrated deterrence means using some of our cap current capabilities differently. It means developing new operational concepts for things that we already have. And it means investing in quantum computing and other cutting edge capabilities for the future in all domains. Think of AI, which will help, help us make decisions with more speed and rigor. Or consider the huge opportunities of edge computing, the framework that lets us process data as it's being collected and absorb it and share it instantaneously, enabling us to find not just one needle in one haystack, but 10 needles in 10 haystacks and to share their locations with other platforms. But this isn't just about technology. It's about thinking differently for all of us. 
And that means that our view of deterrence has to rise above the old stovepipes that can build up in any organization. Deterrence in the space and cyber domains and nuclear deterrence itself shouldn't be seen as somehow entirely separate from the sweep operations. Truly powerful deterrence doesn't rely on any particular platform or service. It relies on the networks that we build across the force. And we stand ready to defend America from the, high, from the heavens to the high seas to the main world. Any adversary thinking of pressing us for an advantage in one domain must know that we can respond, not just in that arena, but in many others as well. The power to deter rests on the guaranteed and clearly understood ability to respond to aggression in the time and manner of our choosing. In space, for example, Integrated deterrence would mean ensuring that capabilities like our global positioning system can continue even if our adversaries attack it with missiles or cyber tools or space-based weapons. Integrated deterrence would also mean employing cyber effects in one location to respond to a maritime security incident hundreds of miles away. And integrated deterrent means all of us giving our all. It means that working together is an imperative and not an option. It means that capabilities must be shared across lines as a matter of course and not as an exception to the rule. And it means that coordination across commands and services need to be a reflex and not an afterthought. You know, I've been there. I'm a former combatant commander and senior service leader. I get it. I know the temptations and the impulses, the desires to preserve what you believe is your equity. And I indulged in that kind of thinking myself back in the day. But I also see what's coming. And there are some old habits that just don't serve our core mission anymore. Integrated deterrence rests on integrated networks among our capabilities, our operations, and our allies. So we'll be working even more closely with our friends in the Indo-Pacific and elsewhere, particularly in Europe, to strengthen a rules-based international order that favors the advance of freedom. Our allies, as I've said before, are a force multiplier, a strategic advantage that none of our competitors can match. And they are the foundation of our shared security, and I can tell you that this department will never take them for granted. And that's why my first overseas trip was to this region to, vi to visit those allies and partners. I'm excited to work to pull together the strengths of our regional partners more closely. And their contributions are particularly crucial in this theater, our priority theater of operations. And that brings me to the leadership of this great command. They show us the very best of the U.S. military, and that is the best that there is. And for the past three years, Admiral Phil Davidson has done a superb job, an absolutely superb job, at the helm of this organization. He's the so-called old salt the Navy's longest serving surface warfare officer. And he has always been a tremendous leader. As a lieutenant in Desert Storm, he bravely led a team in support of amphibious operations that held a major Iraqi force in place on the Kuwaiti coast. And that prevented the enemy from attacking our ground forces and helped swiftly end the war. And he earned a Navy Commendation Medal with valor for that operation and showed his trademark of cool leadership under pressure. And since then, Admiral Davidson has led at every echelon of command. From his time as a captain of the USS Taylor 
to his tenure as a commander of U.S. Fleet Forces Command and everything in between, he has proven superb in every ship and every assignment. And nobody, but nobody understands this theater better than him. And nobody, but nobody is a better ally and partner. Under his leadership, this command upheld the lawful use of the sea for all countries by executing more than 40 freedom of navigation operations. This command conducted more than 20 major bilateral and multilateral joint exercises with our allies and partners. And this command did not flinch amid the huge operational challenges of the pandemic and executed critical missions to support FEMA and other COVID relief efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, the Indo-Pacific Command is better prepared, better trained, and better equipped today than it ever was. Thanks to all of you, and thanks to your great commander. Admiral, it's my honor to thank you for your lifetime of distinguished service. You've always believed in something bigger than yourself, and you put your life on the line to protect the country that you love and you're leaving a legacy to be proud of. And we bid you and Tracy and Ben and Laura fair winds and following seas. Thank you, Phil. Bravo, Zulu, and well done. Today, Admiral, you're passing the helm to another exceptional leader, Admiral Aquilino. And this command is lucky to have him ready to step up and defend our democracy. He's a graduate of the famous Top Gun School. And as a young naval aviator, he proved his prowess early on, flying the F-14 Tomcat and three different variants of the F-18 Hornet and the F-16 Falcon and more. You know, we ask our naval aviators to perform some of the most difficult and dangerous missions in the entire military. And that includes flying combat missions pretty routinely and landing on aircraft carriers. And I'm told that landing on an aircraft carrier is like driving a car into a moving garage at 60 miles an hour and slamming on the brakes and stopping it within an inch of the back wall. Now, imagine doing that more than 1,100 times, and sometimes in the dead of night. That's the type of focus and professionalism that Admiral Aquilino has brought to our military for more than 35 years. He's amassed a strong record of excellence and courage. The Admiral has flown missions in operations such as Southern Watch, Noble Eagle, and Iraqi Freedom. And he's helped train and mentor the next generation of naval aviators. He's commanded a squadron, a wing, and a strike group, which means that he knows a thing or two about leading American forces into combat. And as a commander of U.S. Pacific Fleet, he knows what it's like to lead in this theater and to reinforce our integrated deterrence in this pivotal period. Your new commander knows the stakes. He knows the people, and he knows the challenges. Admiral Aquilino, you are the right leader at the right time. Chris, we know why Americans have followed you into danger, and we trust that you'll lead them to safety. You've earned this department's highest trust and confidence, and I know that you'll lean in. I know that you'll act boldly and honorably, and I know that you'll take care of the men and women under your command just as you've done throughout your outstanding career. It's a big mission, but I know that this command is up to it. And I'm proud, I am proud of every single one of you. Admiral, may God bless you and all those placed in your charge. And may God bless the United States of America. 
Thank you very much. The Secretary of Defense and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff will now present awards to Admiral and Mrs. Davidson. First, Admiral Davidson's award. The Defense Distinguished Service Medal is hereby presented to Philip S. Davidson. Admiral Philip S. Davidson, United States Navy, distinguished himself by exceptionally meritorious service as Commander, United States Indo-Pacific Command, from May 2018 to April 2021. During this period, his profound understanding of regional political military affairs and his commitment to partnership, readiness, and presence were fundamental to the success of the United States security strategy in the vast and globally important Indo-Pacific region. He brilliantly led nearly 370,000 personnel and personnel from partner nations, leaving well-postured forces to maintain peace and stability and address future challenges in the Indo-Pacific. As a sincere, thoughtful ambassador, Admiral Davidson forged stronger bonds with our nation's allies and partners while strengthening relationships with the state of Hawaii and enhancing the quality of life for command personnel and their families. This distinguished accomplishment of Admiral Davidson during his illustrious career in the service of his country reflects great credit upon him, the United States Navy, and the Department of Defense. At this time, Mrs. Davidson will receive an award from General Milley. The Distinguished Public Service Award is hereby presented to Tracy Davidson for distinguished public service to the Department of Defense through a succession of extraordinary contributions and tireless support to all of the personnel assigned to United States Indo-Pacific Command from May 2018 to April 2021. Mrs. Davidson generously gave of her time and talents to enha enhance the quality of life throughout the Indo-Pacific region. Her compassion for people and firm advocacy for policies and programs directly benefited the health, welfare, education, and morale of sailors, soldiers, airmen, Marines, guardians, and Coast Guardsmen and their families. Her many contributions directly supported the command's mission to advance regional security and prosperity throughout the Indo-Pacific region. The distinctive accomplishments of Mrs. Davidson are in keeping with the finest traditions of public service and reflect great credit upon herself, the United States Indo-Pacific Command, and the Department of Defense. Signed, General Mark A. Milley, United States Army, Chairman, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Ladies and gentlemen, the commander, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral Phil Davidson. Aloha again. I apologize for losing my sword there. You've never seen a 61-year-old man put on a sword. You know we'd be here for another 20 minutes while I tried to put that together. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for the inspiring words and your very, very kind remarks. And on behalf of all the men and women here at Indo-PACOM, I want to thank you for your leadership and for affirming the Indo-Pacific region as the priority theater for U.S. national security. Today, as we meet in this beautiful and historic setting at Pearl Harbor 
and enjoy the wonderful Hawaiian weather here in Oahu, I can't help but reflect on how special this place is to me and my family. For those tuning in virtually, behind me are the Arizona Memorial and the USS Missouri. The Arizona Memorial is the iconic symbol marking the beginning of World War II. The USS Missouri, where the instruments of surrender were signed, marks the end. There is no more glorious place for a change of command, a retirement, or frankly, any Navy ceremony than right here in Pearl Harbor. My very first assignment was here aboard USS Badger, FF-1071, now long gone. And that first CO pinned this very warfare device on my chest just over here at the Bravo Piers. Our son Benjamin was born here, and our daughter Laura recently married here, and both went to high school or middle school here in the Aloha State. My first tour was here, and now my last. So you can tell there's a certain symmetry of this setting for Tracy and I. And much like the Arizona Memorial and the Missouri, it was a beginning and now an end. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been the privilege of my lifetime to serve this military and to serve this nation. And as one reaches the end of their time in uniform, no matter the warfare specialty, whether begun in the field like General Milley, in a cockpit like Admiral Aquilino, or on the bridge of a warship like me, the thing you remember the most are the people, the incredible men and women of our armed forces who serve this nation. They are the classmates, the shipmates, the roommates, and yes, the cubicle mates who come to work with the missions on their minds and plunge into the line every day, as I like to say, for the quarter inch gain it takes to defend this nation every day. And whether one serves for four years or 40 years, it is their service to our nation that truly makes a difference. So, to all of our veterans here today and those watching from afar, thank you for your selfless service. We simply would not be here without you. <clears throat> I need to say thank you to some others here who helped me on this tour. Thank you to all the former Indo-PACOM commanders, Admirals Mackey, Preer, Blair, Fargo, Fallon, Keating, Willard, Locklear, and Harris. Every one of them has been in touch at one time or another with sage advice and outright help. To Governors Ige and Ariyoshi, Mayors Blanjardi and Caldwell, and Mayors Victorino, Kawakami, and Roth, and to our federal legislators and the Hawaii Chamber of Commerce Military Affairs Council. Thank you for all that you do to help advance our national defense while cultivating the very strong relationship between the military and the state of Hawaii. Thank you to the Indo-PACOM components and mission partners, Generals LaCamera and Wilsbach, Lieutenant Generals Rudder and Schneider, Brigadier General Rudd, Rear Admiral Hayes and Sibley of the Coast Guard, and senior executive service members Joe Martin and Pete Gumatautau, and of course, General Abrams in Korea, and all of their teams, thank you for all you do for the Joint Force. To the headquarters staff here at Camp Smith, to the Minahans, the Fentons, the Clarks, the Vera's Lums, to the Jaders and their deputies, the foreign policy advisors, the whole of the bridge staff, to Casey and Jenny, and to the most amazing group of Indo-PACOM officers and enlisted and civilian men and women who make the largest and oldest combatant command go. I can only offer my simple thanks for all you do day in and day out, 24-7, 365. To all the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, Guardians, DOD civilians, contractors, and families of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command and spread across half the globe, thank you for all that you have done for Indo-PACOM and for the peace and security of the United States and the Indo-Pacific region. And of course, to my family, Tracy, Laura, and Ben, now Kevin as well, words cannot do justice to the love, admiration, and pride I have for you. You have been my very keel, flex but never break. Tracy, my Mustang Sally, side by side for nearly 39 years, we started with numbered letters that took weeks to arrive to my ship that was just off the Soviet mainland and ended it with instantaneous texts and some 23 houses in our wake. You made it all a joy. Thanks.
I'm reciting today's lineup to the Cardinal game, just to get it together. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America was funded, uh, founded, excuse me, on the fundamental idea of liberty. Indeed, it was the desire for liberty that spawned the American Revolution. And ever since, the United States has always demonstrated a willingness to stand up for, to defend, and when called upon, to put our lives on the line in the name of liberty. In my book, liberty is more than individual freedom. Liberty is the idea that we will come together in order to defend the collection of freedoms necessary for a people, a nation, even a region to prosper, thrive, and survive. At the heart of it, liberty is freedom from authoritarianism, from those who would restrict or eliminate our freedoms. Fundamentally, it's the power of choice. And at the end of the day, our liberty is dependent upon our willingness to work together to assure those freedoms. The converse, well, the absence of liberty is the path to tyranny. And as John Adams famously stated, liberty, once lost, is lost forever. One need only look around the region to witness how our liberties would be in jeopardy without the leadership of the United States and the critical partnership of our allies and partners in maintaining the international order. Make no mistake, the Communist Party of China seeks to supplant the idea of a free and open international order with a new order, one with Chinese characteristics, one where Chinese national power is more important than international law. Beijing's very pernicious approach to the region includes a whole party effort to coerce, corrupt, and co-opt governments, businesses, organizations, and the people of the Indo-Pacific. But the strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific is not between our two nations. It is a competition between liberty, the fundamental idea behind a free and open Indo-Pacific, and authoritarianism, the absence of liberty, and the objective of the Communist Party of China. But let me be clear, this competition does not have to put us on the road to conflict. Our number one job is to keep the peace. And to do that, we must be prepared to fight and win. It is why we speak of the importance of deterrence, why you heard it from the Secretary of Defense so eloquently today, why we at Indopaycom advocate for the Pacific Deterrence Initiative itself, and why we ready the joint force with the capacity, the capabilities, and the needs to facilitate our ability to win. The fundamental mission at U.S. Indo-Pacific Command is to defend America, our U.S. territories and interests abroad, as well as our allies in the region. That is why we exist. Three years ago, I stood at this podium and said, our relationships matter. The Secretary said it just a moment ago. And indeed, from that day on, we have made it the work of Indo-PACOM to deter our adversaries, strengthen our alliances, and enhance our emerging partnerships across the Indo-Pacific. So to our allies in the region, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Australia, the Republic of the Philippines, and Thailand, you have no better ally and no better friend than the United States. To the freely associated states of the Republic of Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands, to whom we have direct defense obligations, rest assured, you can always count on us in times of peace and in peril. And to our many close partners in the region, Singapore, New Zealand, India, Vietnam, Fiji, and many, many others, we will continue to expand on the terrific progress made in recent years. Please know that the United States is deeply committed to advancing and expanding these vital relationships to help promote our collective pursuit of peace and prosperity. Indeed, our liberty, while enhancing security and stability in the Indo-Pacific. We are stronger together, and the why is simple. Our voices in the Pacific region, Indo-Pacific region, are stronger when we work together, and our voices are strongest when we speak through our shared values. Our shared values are at the very heart of a free and open Indo-Pacific. These values will continue to bring peace and prosperity to the region. Why? In the next 10 years, two-thirds of the world's population 
and two-thirds of the global economy will be centered right here in the Indo-Pacific. I have every confidence that our commitment to liberty in the region will continue to stand the test of time and our values will be victorious in upholding the rules-based international order in the decades to come. After all, and I'm paraphrasing Benjamin Franklin here, those who would give up essential liberty for a bit of temporary security deserve neither liberty nor security. The United States will stand for the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific and for the preservation of liberty in this region. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, thank you again for presiding over today's ceremony. Thank you, Chairman Milley, for your kind words. Thanks to all in attendance and those watching online. May God bless the men and women of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, the Department of Defense, the great state of Hawaii, and may God bless the USA. I wish all of you good health. Thank you. Mahalo. Ahui ho. Thank you. I will now read my orders. CNO Order 0621, your request to be transferred to the retired list on 1 May has been approved by the Secretary of Defense. You are hereby relieved in April 2021 from duty as Commander U.S. Indo-Pacific Command and may proceed to your home of selection. Signed, Admiral M. M. Gilday, United States Navy, Chief of Naval Operations. Command Sergeant Major Shorter, haul down my flag. Admiral Aquilino, I am ready to be relieved. I will now read my orders. Chief of Naval Operations Order 1171, when directed by reporting senior to attach in April 21 a report for duty as commander, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, signed Admiral Mike Gilday, Chief of Naval Operations. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in recognizing and congratulating the 26th Commander of the United States Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral John Aquilino. <clears throat> Sergeant Major, break my flag.
Very well. Aloha. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. Uh, each of you honor Admiral Davidson, me and our families, uh, with your presence today. And I'd ask for two minutes to please bear with me because I also have some important thank yous to recognize today. Uh, first, this is awesome, Mrs. Milley, thanks for coming today. We really have nice to have you in Hawaii. Secretary Austin, Chairman Milley, I'm honored and humbled to take this important position during a most consequential time. Thank you both for your support and for your confidence in me. To Governor Ige, former Governor Ariyoshi, the Hawaii delegation, uh, Mr. Mayor, Hawaii leadership, uh, I see uh, Alan and Jacqueline and Connie and all of those in Hawaii, thank you very much for all you do for our service members here in this wonderful place. Thank you very much. To our ambassadors that have come today, uh, specifically Amro Shahidul, Amro Ari Sinha, and Ambassador Ha. Representing their countries and our esteemed diplomatic consular corps, thank you all for your dedicated work every day. To General Wan, General Yamasaki, uh, my battle buddy Admiral Noonan, Admiral Liu, and all those representing their chiefs of defense and their great nations, as well as my heads of Navy counterparts who I hope are watching today. Thank you very much for your frank discussions, for your friendship. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you very much. To my component commander buddies, I see Pauly here, I saw Cruiser and Stick and Matt. Thanks a lot. Uh, that's a group uh, that you cannot put together uh, certainly the best group of teammates I've ever worked with, and I thank you for all your support uh, and, again, all of our work together. Thank you very, very much. To my Navy family far and wide, specifically the Pacific Fleet team, boy, there are none better. I'm in awe of the amazing work and the effort put forth every day to achieve the goals that Admiral Davidson, the Secretary, and the Chairman have set. Uh, I can't thank you enough. To the Kapoi family, Vincent and Renette are here, I think. I didn't see you, but I hope you're here. To the Augustine family, to my extended family, I know Matt and Joy are here. Laura and Maki, Marissa's here. I see Tony and Andrea and many others. We can't do it without your love and support. Thank you very much. Your presence here today means a great deal. Can't thank you enough for being part of our family. Okay, to Admiral Davidson, Tracy, and family, thank you. Almost four decades of lifelong service to the Navy and our nation. Thanks for your strategic vision. Thanks for your leadership. Thanks for your mentorship. Everyone here is better because of you, especially for your last three years. Please, a round of applause for the Davidsons. Okay, last and certainly not least uh, to my amazing family. It's led by my wife, Laura, my daughters, Jessica and Lisa. Like every service member's family, they have endured much personal sacrifice, and I have asked a lot. I love you all, and I'm so very proud of you. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary and Chairman, I stand here today first because of you. Thank you very much again. Second, because of the many years of service with the great men and women whom I have had the privilege to serve alongside. And to those I have learned from over the many years. Some will tell you I need a lot of help. Let me give you some names of those who, uh, over my time, have helped me to learn, understand, and grow. There are names like Admiral Moran, Gortney, Harris, Fargo, Zlatiper, Keating, Locklear, Fallon, Mackey, Richardson, and Harvey. Generals with names like 
Odierno, Votel, C.Q. Brown, and Neller, to name just a few. Thank all of you for your mentorship and your friendship over the years. Uh, just so you're all aware, those calls will keep coming and at strange hours of the evening. Thank you very much. For more than 75 years, the U.S. partnerships with like-minded allies have created an environment where all nations could thrive and prosper. The foundation of this environment is a rules-based international order in which all nations, large and small, have an equal voice for peaceful resolution of disputes and can openly share differences of opinion in order to maintain peace and stability in the region. Today, this environment is being challenged. The Indo-Pacific is the most consequential region for America's future. It hosts our greatest security challenge, and it remains the priority theater for the United States. Mr. Secretary, as you have directed, Indo-PACOM remains committed to defending our nation. We are committed to strengthening the relationships with our allies and partners across the globe. We are committed to providing the deterrence needed to prevent great power conflict. And should it be directed, we're committed to be able to fight tonight and win. We will compete to achieve our national interests. We will cooperate where we can. And we will confront where we must in order to maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific. When Admiral Nimitz took over Sink PAC on December 17, 1941, he humbly captured the gravity of the moment by simply writing to his boss, it is a great responsibility, but I shall do my utmost to meet it. A copy of that memo of Admiral Nimitz's handwritten note adorns nearly every desk in the Pacific Fleet Headquarters today. It reminds us of the magnitude and the significance of this theater. As I assume the command of Indo-PACOM, Mr. Secretary, you have my full and unwavering commitment to take on this great responsibility, and I will do my best to meet it. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the benediction and remain standing for the departure of the official party. Let us pray. Almighty God, as Admiral Aquilino assumes the mantle of command, we ask that you grant him the wisdom of Solomon, the strength of Samson, and the humility and determination of Moses. Bless us with a smooth transition, and may all who serve under his leadership do all in our power to understand and fulfill our commander's intent. Under his leadership, continue to bless the Indo-PACOM headquarters as well as all the components and the joint force throughout the Indo-Pacific region. Place your hand upon Admiral Aquilino now and guide his steps. Bless all present as we set out from this significant ceremony, we pray in your holy name, amen. Side boys, post. Ladies and gentlemen, Major General Suzanne Barris Lum will now offer a traditional poem of aloha for Admiral and Mrs. Davidson. Who 
kamakani. The winds roar. Po pono na pea heki aku ana. A full sail helped him to arrive. Koma mai kau mapuna hoi. Dip your paddle in. E la hoi mai navaa ike ka ike hoi ike hoi ike ka ike pai aku ike aina. Everybody paddle the canoes together. Bail and paddle. Paddle and bail. And the shore will be reached. He ho kelevaa no kala ino. A steersman for a stormy day. Kihe ka ihu ika ale. One who sneezes when the spray from the surf rises at the bow of the canoe. A ohe hana, Davidson. Ua kao kavaa ike aki. Davidson has nothing more to do. His canoe is resting on the block. Assembled to my right are the ceremonial side boys, selected by Admiral Davidson because of their personal and professional relationships. They are Lieutenant General Mike Minahan, Deputy Commander, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Lieutenant General Brian Fenton, current Senior Military Assistant to the Secretary of Defense and former Deputy Commander, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Major General Suzanne Varas Lum, former Mobilization Assistant to the Commander, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Rear Admiral Select Adam Kujo Kijek, Executive Assistant to the Commander, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Captain Mike Kafka, Public Affairs Officer, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Chief Warrant Officer Second Class Casey Sellers, Admiral Davidson's personal flag rider. Command Sergeant Major Shane Shorter, the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Commander, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command and Sergeant Major Retired Anthony Spadaro, former Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Commander, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Ladies and gentlemen, in keeping with the time-honored naval tradition, Admiral Davidson will now request permission from the Secretary of Defense to go ashore for the final time. Time orderly, strike eight bells. Admiral Philip S. Davidson, Mrs. Tracy Davidson and family, United States Navy, retired, departing. Retire the side boys. Ladies and gentlemen, our official party will now depart along with their families.
Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Admiral Davidson and Admiral Acalino, I extend their sincere appreciation for your attendance. Prior to the start of the reception, the official party will conduct a cake cutting and then move into position for receiving lines. We ask that you wait to form the receiving lines until after directed by protocol personnel. A short reception will, admit, will, will start immediately following the cake cutting in the area to my right for invited guests. Ushers will be in place to assist you in the proper areas. Please ensure that during the receiving line and short reception to follow, that you follow all COVID mitigation protocols. This